Hi everybody, this is Nedra Russ, and I'm coming at you from my studio up here in the mountains um, in Northern California. And uh, that song that I introed with today is Julio and I's Fall Before Night, one of our favorites and one that's traveling the world as we speak, one of the most played this year's songs on Spotify. Um, it's a journey. Music's a journey and um, a quest and a lifestyle. And I've got the ethics guy who's starting on his harmonica journey. Started at the um, in, during COVID, lots of change went on there. So I'm going to get right into it and let him tell you about his discovery and his journey now with the harmonica. Hi, everybody. I'm here today with Dr. Bruce Weinstein, also known as the ethics guy. Oh, you know, I love that. I, I really <laughs> am excited to hear about your life and um how that you became the ethics guy. And I know you're a doctor, so you obviously studied to get a doctorate in what you do. But what led you to choose that? It really began in high school government class when we were invited to choose any three books that had some relationship to government or politics to read and write reports about. And do you remember the Franklin Library that was... um, published in the 70s. It was these beautiful leather-bound volumes of classic works with gold appointments. And my dad subscribed to that. And one of the volumes was Plato's Republic. And I'd never read any philosophy, so I picked that one. And I was surprised at how engaging and entertaining it was. But it, it read, you know, Plato wrote in dialogue. So they're written like movie scripts. But um, what they're about, the stakes couldn't be higher. So I I was really intrigued by that. And in college, I decided to major in philosophy, largely because of that experience reading Plato. And I took an ethics course and I said, that's it. That's what I want to do. Because it just occurred to me, or it seemed to me that there's nothing more worthwhile to study than how we ought to live our lives, which is what ethics is about. And um, I had wrestled with going to medical school because my father was a physician. And in fact, I did go to medical school, but it takes most people four years to graduate. It took me three months to realize this is not for me. And at that point, I was considering going to film school because I've loved cinema since I was six. But that just seemed like a radical move. And medical ethics was becoming a field in and of itself. And so I thought, uh, moving from medicine to medical ethics was a, a less risky move. Um, and like a lot of the people who uh, went to graduate school with me, Georgetown University's graduate program in medical ethics, I became a professor. Actually, I became a professor at the medical school that I dropped out. So the people who were close to failing me in anatomy class were now my colleagues, which is really strange. But after about six years of that, I decided I didn't want to do that. And I I quit one year away from getting tenure. And I went to South Africa and made a documentary about the Chicago Children's Choir that um, was touring South Africa to bring to use music to bring people together. It was just after the fall of apartheid. And I made this film. I. I spent everything I had. I had a, an investor, but I I, it, I couldn't sell it. And it was strange to me, Nedra, because I thought w- what would be of greater interest than the topics of music and children? But it turned out that that was not of great interest to the world uh, at that time, probably still, sadly. And therefore, while I was trying to recover from that experience, I I knew I could give speeches to make, you know, make ends meet. And I started to do that there, go on the so-called lecture circuit. And then I found out I was getting booked a lot and that I enjoyed doing it and I was getting great evaluations. So it was kind of an accidental career because I didn't set out to do this. But um, so when I moved to New York uh, 20 years ago, the one of the first gigs I got was to 12 physicians in California on a Saturday morning for $500. And I was, I was 
glad to get it because that was a lot of money to me. Just, you know, no one knew who I was. But then I think four years later, I was speaking to 6,000 people as a keynote speaker in convention centers for a bit more than 500. So um, now I don't know if you've ever had this experience. I, I wish everyone could have the experience of telling a joke to 6,000 people and hearing these peals of laughter, these waves of laughter, it's its such a kick. And I can see how people get addicted to that because you we mistakenly think that they, that they like us rather than like the joke that we made. And, um, but so in any case, uh, I now travel around the world speaking about ethics and I write books on ethics. I write about ethical leadership for Forbes. And now, actually, since the pandemic, I'm creating a lot of training videos in ethics for various professionals. And so uh, the bottom line is here we are. The ethics guy meets the harmonica lady. Oh, I'm, oh my goodness. No, that story is fantastic. In fact, your documentary just gave me goosebumps. I think that is a wonderful thing. I think that uh, you're an artist and you found an outlet that uh, works. And that and what else can you do? I mean, that's wonderful. And it sounds like you've always been rather driven to um, make a difference in the world. That and I and I think humor, art, music, children, all of those things are the hope of the world. And and we're in rough times right now, ethically, poli politically, um, lots of things going on out there that uh, that need the voices to be heard. And like you said, it, it's kind of a shame that that they didn't get the part about how important that documentary was because the children and the apartheid and the just all of it and the blue it all ties together. I mean, to me, in my mind, the the blues, the music, the struggle, um, and what better way than with humor? But and I love humor. I mean, it to mm -hmm. me, laughter is. It's such good medicine and uh really thrilled and and uh delighted that you that the story about my film which i call singing in color gave you goosebumps because it had the opposite effect on hbo when i pitched it there the uh one of the um executives called me and he said this film raises two questions so i'm not making this up he said so what and who cares uh, and, and then, and then after that, after kicking me in the teeth, he, he ends the conversation by saying, and if you have any other projects, don't hesitate to pitch them to me. Yeah, right. You'll be the first one I go to. <laughs> so, but, and the funny thing is one of the uh, parts of the film, I went to Nelson Mandela's house in Johannesburg and filmed him uh, speaking to the children. And you know what? That was a much easier interview to get than some of the harmonica players I've tried to interview um, like you. Uh, I love doing interviews. I don't have a podcast, but I'm interviewing a lot of folks for uh, Spa's quarterly publication, Harmonica Happenings. Right. And I actually, I even, just when I began studying Harmonica, I wrote about it in Forbes, about leadership lessons that I was getting from the Harmonica community. So it, it's, um, I have just so loved becoming a part of this amazing community studying harmonica with David Barrett, which I began in 2020 when the pandemic began, going to spa, going to trusting into the harmonica master's workshops with Steve Baker. It's just phenomenal. I mean, they're just wonderful people. And I have to tell you, and I, I, I bet this may be true for you too. One of the absolute highlights of spa, a, a week of many highlights is of the conference is sitting in the lobby with those octogenarian fellows and just jamming and uh, and i i forget their names uh, do you know the name oh uh, this yes it's is it perdillo uh, or uh it's this this the sorrow brothers the, the sorrow yes yes thank the sorrow brothers they're uh, italians and they're oh my god the wives and they are my best friends there um vending with them is phenomenal they they they're Italian, of course, so they set up food out there. And I, I can remember the harmonica players come by and go, "Well, this is a good idea." And they're eating and drinking some. They put out water and candy and cookies, and and then that got everybody to their booth, and it opened them up. And they were just, you know, and being a vendor is a whole different experience. And I 
and just wonderful. Just you're in there fully with everyone and everyone comes through the vending area because that's a, it's a pretty cool place. And I, and then they'd sit in, in, in um, Tulsa, they sit right out of the door there and they play and, and all of them just, yes, that is a total. It was so much island. fun to do that. And speaking of the, the vendor, when I went to my first spot convention uh, in St. Uh, in Tulsa last year, Charlie Musselwhite am ambles up and, I introduced myself and started talking with them. And I actually, when I worked at a high-end stereo store in San Antonio in the late seventies, we used his direct to disc album as a, as a way of showing off the high-end stereo equipment. And so I asked him about that. And I think he seemed surprised because it's not a very well-known album. It, it involves, there's, there's no middleman or middlewoman, if you will, the, uh, the recording goes right from the microphone to uh, cutting the the disc itself. That's why it's called direct to disc. Wow. And and there are no stops. You have to do the whole, each side in one take. So we talked about that. But I mean, imagine going to a, a conference for guitars where Eric Clapton is one of the speakers or or presenters or musicians. Do you think you could just amble up to Eric Clapton? I don't think so. Or and Charlie's uh, at least there at a bass con guitar convention, but. But he's just so accessible. And you talk about uh, humor. He's just like you, just an easy laugh, just affable. And he, he talks about playing the harmonica after all these decades with such joy. And he's always smiling. And it's just it's just wonderful. I mean, yeah. So in talking about Charlie Musselwhite and um, there in Tulsa, I um, had the pleasure to sell his CDs and, and hang out with him. He I was kind of his liaison that uh, was taking care of his business there and listening to his stories and his travels and, and his amazing, amazing journey. And the CD that he was um, selling there was the one that he made during the pandemic because we're talking about change and things. And he went and tells the story, and I put it up in the last podcast about it. So I'm going to play one of his songs right now before we do more talking. And here it is. It is entitled, Blues Gave Me a Ride. <laughs> Down the road When blues gave me a ride You know blues tells the truth In a world that's full of lies I was raised up in Memphis That's down on 61 But you'll find me in Clarksdale where I have my fun Now if blues Stops for you won't you jump on board? You can forget all your troubles and roll on down the road. Well, now, baby, hear that sound. Hear that howling wind. You know it blows just like this old world is about to end. brought you to us what brought you to the harmonica community and how did that start for you it was the show jeopardy in march 2020 right when the lockdown began uh in double jeopardy 
there was a category musical instruments. And the second to last hardest question was the, the answer was Bob Dylan plays this instrument with a guitar. And of course, the question is, what is a harmonica? And when I saw that, I thought, huh, that might be fun to, to take a look at. So that just set me on the journey. And, you know, as as is a common denominator, the Spock invention, what we all go down the rabbit hole. So uh, for me, it was just Googling harmonica teachers. And I found this really cool fellow from England, Ben Hewlett, I believe is his name. Um, I think he's with a harmonica UK group on Facebook, but he has some, yeah. yes, he has some courses on Udemy. So I signed up for that. And then I find found Adam Gusso's wonderful tutorials on YouTube. But then when I bought a Honor harmonica at the time, every harmonica sold in the world had a one month free um, subscription to bluesharmonica.com with David Barrett. Yeah. And so I thought, oh, I'll just sign up for that. And a few then it was so cool. I decided to buy a, a year's uh, subscription or membership. And a few months later, I get an email from Sharon Barrett, uh, his wife, who helps run the business, saying there's an open slot uh, for students. Uh, if you'd like to study with David, it's usually several years waiting list, but someone just dropped out and I immediately took it and it just changed my life. And so now <laughs> every let's see, two Tuesdays a month there. I have one hour private lessons with him wow. Friday afternoons from one to two are the performance group uh, activities where we take turns playing, let's say uh, improvising um, the AAA chorus form. And yeah. Monday from four to five is the ear training group. Yesterday, there was a three and a half hour workshop on using the software finale. It's, it's all harmonica all the time. And I couldn't be happier. I really have not been this excited intellectually or stimulated this much but with the harmonica i'm constantly finding new books there was a, a new book this fellow paul um barry i believe just wrote a biography of william clark so i snapped that up um harmonica dummies and blues harmonica for dummies by winslow yeah. yerksa all Have these all. Wonderful resources i just can't get enough of this it's just yeah <laughs> and, and like for and here like just last night um can you play the riff on a C harmonica for the um the song uh, "Low Rider" by War, you know that that famous yeah, that, that harmonic riff. Isn't it? Uh, isn't that Lee Oscar? Or am I wrong? Uh, it, it is indeed. It is indeed. Yeah. And um, yeah, yeah, I can't. It, I, it goes I like can't. this. It goes. But then to get that low note in there, it's a two draw whole step, Ben. And th this is where I, all your listeners are going to uh, switch to another podcast. <laughs> hey, man, I've only been studying three Not years. So no, no, I know. You know ben. what? That That's great. Uh, that is a very hard, hard um, double step down. And, and one of the things is you don't know if you're actually on the right note while you're holding it as well. And there's a handy tool out there, the Harmonica Tuner Pro, and it will show you whatever key you're in. You can practice with it to see if you're actually hitting that F and if you're sustaining it um, and if it's in tune or not. And these are helpful tools. And when you're studying with a teacher like David, you want to make sure you're hitting that note. So get that for your phone and try it out. It's a pretty nifty little tool. And so you can see that um, he took his first step and he's not regretting it at all. And I can be taken back to when I decided to uh, change my life path and become more of a harmonicist. And I started out on my journey by taking my beat up old car and uh, driving down to San Jose Convention Center, renting a room and staying and taking the master classes that David Barrett put on. And I continued to do those as well as books back in those days that the internet wasn't as readily available and the speeds were dial up and that kind of thing. So it was a different journey, but being in person and in, in the midst of it all and learning from the best and having that opportunity is priceless for me. And, um, I wouldn't trade a cent in for it. it it's that good. And so he's talking about, you know, David Barrett and David Barrett, um, is a dedicated, uh, blues man that teaches uh, blues the way it should be taught. And um, 
if you're interested, just the price of admission uh, for a month of his class will probably lead you to more months because he has interviews and he has classes and the way that he teaches each of the lessons. And he, he has all kinds of um, really good information and, and on all the levels of blues harmonica. So that is your place to go for history and for the proper training in that. Um, I'm going to play for you here off of the It Takes Three, three generations of South Bay blues harmonica players. We've got Gary Smith, David Barrett, and Aki Kumeyer. You've got teachers and students and teachers and students forever there that are the top of the line. And it's called Mojo Hand. Like I played, got my mojo working. We're going to play Mojo Hand. And now this song is in A harp in E, second position. That's another um, pos- another thing, learning the positions and what harps do what. So there is so much to learn. So if you want to dig in, you, you, you just go ahead and dig in and, and um, start at the beginning and just keep it, keep it going until you're satisfied. Let's play a little music here now. My baby threw away my mojo Baby threw away my mojo hand. See, I was using it for a protection to ward off all you conniving men. Well, I went down to New Orleans. I talked to the voodoo queen. When I explained my problem, she said, I know just what you mean. But my baby threw my mojo hand away. Well, she threw it in the garbage, hauled it off on garbage day. Well, the first things were going just fine And then she started coming in at dawn I ran for my secret hiding place But my greedy bag was gone Cause my baby Threw away my mojo hand Well, she must have got suspicious And figured out my hoodie plan Are you thinking you're having a good time, you're making your money, you're making your fame, you're making your name? 
are you putting it into a 401k? <laughs> Probably not. But if you have a good business manager, kind of like, um, oh gosh, Howlin' Wolf, evidently his wife was a good business manager and she took care of the money. So there's always that aspect, you know. This is a really important issue, and I've seen this this deficit at both the spa conventions and and, and trusting, and namely any attention paid in the seminars or workshops to the business of music. And unfortunately, musicians in particular and artists in general are among the worst business people. It's almost as though uh, there's a kind of impurity in in having a business business acumen. So, for example. Um, when I went to Trost again, I asked my wife, you know, how how many euros should I bring? She said, don't bring that many. You know, they'll, they'll take credit cards everywhere you go. It's, it's the universal currency. Not true, as it turns out, because um, the artists who were performing in Trostingen at the uh, Harmonica Masters Workshop had all their CDs out and they had no way of processing a credit card. There was no Venmo, nothing like that. It was euros or nothing. And I wanted to support these artists, but I only I think I only had a hundred euros with me wow so uh and so well, i just think having an hour devoted to how to stand up for yourself i mean there's a saying in judaism uh, rabbi hillel said if i am not for myself who will be exactly but if i'm only for myself what am i and if not now when that could be the title of a workshop so there, there's no shame in in wanting to st- Stick up for yourself, wanting to make it make it easy for people to buy your CDs. And I, in fact, I'm going to talk with C. Baker about this uh, for for next year because it would be great if everyone who came with their CDs they come from around the world. There were fellows from from South America, from Scandinavia, and just have a QR code to make it as easy as possible for people to pay. They can use their phone, hold it up to the QR code, and then they send you the twenty euros and. And that's it. It goes right into your bank account. Like so, why well, I've got the square, you know, that. Uh, yeah. But when that's I, right, yeah, to... I, I bought some yeah. things from you and right. I, I do. I, before I forget, though, I want to say that um, I'm very touched by the love and affection that you and Julio have for each other. You're all you're constantly talking about him. He's talking about you. Uh, he was at your um, at your booth, giving you moral support, playing guitar and it, it's just really, it's just really nice to see. It's just, that's all. It's oh, thank you. Yeah. You know, he was funny uh, when we first started vending and um, he would get, I had to run and do something and he was there and the TV crew came to interview and he just, he was just like, oh, uh, well, she, it, it, uh, and so there were hip up, hiccups along and then he really got into it and he started you know, jumping right up to talk about the products and talk about what they were and how they were made. And so, yeah, he's like my, um, he's definitely my partner in every, every single way. And And you, by the way, you have a very good business approach because uh, if you recall, I've purchased some of your um, uh, necklaces with uh, the the small owner or the the little lady harmonicas. And um it kept snapping off and I showed, yeah, I showed it to you and you, you said, Oh, you were grateful for being a prize of it. You didn't get angry or defensive. Like, well, that must be something you're doing, Bruce. I, <laughs> I use the best materials. You said, well, this, there's a new supplier I'm using. So I'm going to make sure, thank you for bringing it to my attention. I'm going to uh, address this. You were almost apologetic about it. It's not your fault really. So I was just impressed by your customer service. Well, you That's know what? It. I think that, it was the first time ever that I had put them on an air. Someone complained. <laughs> no, I'd never had really a problem. I have never. Oh. And I think that somehow through all the jiggling and I tried to pack them all good in there to, to take them. Cause usually we drive and we get there and set up, but I put these on the airplane. And um, so, but no, it was really good because I came home and I bought the right tools and I bought the, the rings that there's no way that'll ever happen again. And I've upgraded the ones that were because one thing I always, I'm rugged on things. I'm, and harmonicas need to be able to be rugged. So I wanted the necklaces. So I wore them and tested them and did things because I want you to be able to be up on stage, having a good time playing your harp and you're wearing your necklace and it's flopping around and you can pick it up and play. And so I just really want them to be one of, not only one of a kind and playable, sturdy, reliable. 
And so there was that whole, then that's where my ethics come in more Mm -hmm. or less is that product should, when you buy something and you pay a nice price, it should last. And so I know I appreciated that. And, um, it was, it was funny because it's like, it's great. And they were, they, they've been in the case a while right now. The, the work is all stored away because we didn't do a few things that we normally do, but Mm -hmm. I'm working towards that. I have, um, speaking engagements and, um, things where we talk harmonica and I talk about what I do and then we play a little bit. We've got things like that with my art coming up. So it'll be back out on the road and I haven't really set up an online store where you can go, but I think it's a product that could be sold worldwide. I think it's it's a good product. It's a wonderful yeah. product. And by the way, if anyone listening to this doesn't know what we're talking about, we're referring to spa, we're not talking about a Swedish massage or Thai yoga massage. We're talking about the Society for the Preservation and Advancement of the Harmonica. Wonderful organization. It, it's ridiculously inexpensive to join. The conventions really are just wonderful, the, the leadership there. So I, as soon as I joined it, I wanted to contribute something. Um, and I, I don't really do well on committees or I didn't want to spend the week running around getting microphones for people. I wanted to enjoy it. So um so instead, I, I write, I love to write, and I write pretty well. So I'm writing for the the magazine. That's my contribution to the I harmonica. Think that's community. awesome. I, I think that's great. And you know, you fit right in with everybody. I I just uh, in my mind's eye, uh, playing the spoons at the end when I and I was playing my mini harmonica. You were playing the spoons, and everybody else was playing harmonica. And that before I had to go hit the plane to come home and. Uh, it's just in my mind's eye. I still see it. And it well, so who is the fellow? He plays guitar. He's sort of the the ringleader, if you will. His brother is a professional guitarist, but he plays rhythm guitar and uh, I guess an acoustic. And he has a chromatic uh, in a in a in a rack. And I, in a moment, if we have time, I want to talk about that. That was a revelation for me. What he was doing with a, a chromatic in a rack because usually it's a diatonic. But um, he was, you know, he would go around and he would call people to take a solo. And I guess after the first time I soloed, he stopped calling on me until I brought out the spoons. Now, when we go around the circle, it'll say spoons. spoons. So I'm, I, you know, I'm making my impression playing spoons, not harmonica yet. But um, no, but I'll get that's there. okay. Yeah. Like David Barrett says, you'll get there. You just don't know when. Exactly, and it, you know what? It is a, it is a long study. Um, I see a lot of people get discouraged and quit and um, give up, get embarrassed. Uh, you, you're going to get embarrassed. I mean, my first time um, I went into a uh, the, the convention in Sacramento and I'd known David from taking his classes and being in the master class and he called on me to sing and I rose. I was like, uh, uh, and I regretted that because that was my opportunity to share my vocals and to be with, with a crowd there. And I just froze. And then later I took the next year, I took his performance training class and got to perform in front of everyone. And I'll tell you, I was nervous. It was like being on stage at spa, your stomach's just, oh, man, you're scared. But once you get going, it's music and it's fun. So so I I believe you were in the audience at um, Michael Dieth's wife. I'm sorry, her name escapes me now, but she gave a wonderful workshop on singing. Brenda? Yes. Uh, Yes. And so I, she invited people to come up and sing and then get a critique. And what's fascinating about that is uh, I was making a mistake. I knew I wasn't doing something right, but it wasn't until everyone in the audience said, you're slouching over, stand up. And uh, getting that kind of feedback is invaluable. It, uh, yeah. it, I mean, if everybody's saying it. So uh, um, that was another wonderful seminar. And uh, it's just it's just such a great community. I just can't sing its praises highly enough. Well, in fact, you know, I agree, of course, but um, that's why I started my radio show is that I felt like um, I did a broadcast for a year here at a radio station and started my podcast because I felt like the world was missing out. There was so much they didn't know and understand and the different types and the different things. And so that's why I started doing these podcasts was to educate the entire planet to listen and, and and know and hear and see. And I start, well, I started with the vlogs on my website. You can go and I had interviews that I would do via email. 
And then I, that's where I started with that, just wanting to share it. And the way to share it to me was just to, um, I'm always told I have a nice voice so that it's calming. And so why not do that, you know, and, um, which in, I enjoy it this year. I didn't do as many podcasts as I'm plan to do in this coming years, because, you know, it's like you said, it is kind of hard to get people to want to talk about it. Um, and so I'll, some really are eager to, I have, um, some podcasts, I think I could go back and, and do a approach them and they'd probably do want to do another one. It's probably time to, um, to hit up Jason and Michael and just different people that I've already interviewed to see what's been going on and what's changed, you know, and so some people are also need to hear from more female players and people of color. I mean, this I'm is trying coming I'm from really the African-American trying. communities. And I'm not, no, I'm not blaming you. I just, I, I just think it would be nice to hear other perspectives. But uh, when I began my journey in 2020, your podcast was one of the first that I listened to all of the episodes in. And in fact, so it was really cool to meet you at Tulsa mm-hmm. after having listened to you. That I don't think that's ever happened where I, I got to know someone through their voice first and then met them. So that was really cool. But you have a very nice way about you. It's it's a wonderful podcast and selfishly, and I'm I'm sure I'm not the only one who feels this way. I, I hope that you are able to do more episodes because I know it take it's very labor intensive and people probably don't appreciate how difficult it is to do a single 40 minute uh, episode, but it is because you're you're a perfectionist is you should be and you care very much about the quality of the sound and uh the quality of the interview so and i you know to be i'm looking at this list of 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 uh people you've interviewed there's charlie musselwhite and michael rubin and um pt gazelle john gindick uh jason ricci i i don't belong on this list of of people you've interviewed, except that, you know, maybe as a, as a novice and to talk about a little bit about the learning curve and, and picking this up. And, and also I have to say, I picked the two areas in human knowledge and skill that are the least respected in the world, ethics and the harmonica. People think because, you know, we can all play harmonicas when we're three years old, that it's easy to play. And Jason Ricci did make the point in his spa seminar that he doesn't mind it when people refer to it as a, as a toy because he said, what do you do with a toy? You play it. But it doesn't get the respect it deserves. And of course, ethics. The reason I have a career is because most professionals need to have continuing education credits in ethics. So nurses, accountants, physicians, attorneys. And so they come to my sessions because they need the credit and then I hope that they find out it can be fun and entertaining, but they're they they're they're not choosing to be there really. They they need uh, what I'm offering, but um, no, I don't I, care yeah. that I picked a harmonica and ethics. I just love these two things. I just love them both. I I think that it's great. Um, I the reason I really want I want people to know who you are and to hear what you're doing because that I like to encourage people not to quit. And they think it's easy, just like you said. Oh, you pick it up, you blow in and out. In fact, I I I hand them out. You know, Horner sends me, and I I hand them out, and I at different festivals and things, and the kids will get them and they enjoy them. And I tell the parents, um, they because it is in tune when you blow in and out. It's designed to sound okay, but it's really hard to conquer all the notes and there's so much diversity in learning or, or to play skills. a single note well, let me ask you this so that two oh, draw whole step hard. bend uh, i'm just curious cuz that two draw whole step bend is really difficult how long did it take for you to be able to play that without sounding like you're strangling a parrot or something um just by um daily going into um howard levy's class and repeating the lessons someone at i we've got we've gotten a pretty good following over on TikTok and um uh they're young cuz you know they show you the demographics when you go in and see what what your stats are and your uh, your analytical stats are and it's most of the time we're baby boomers and beyond you know and male female older people but this demographic is young and so they'll ask questions like well how long did it take you to get to play this good <laughs> or i hope i sound like that when i'm 80 and so you get all these little comments and I'll always say, start at the beginning, practice daily, keep going no matter what. 
and sooner or later you'll arrive there. And well, I asked Joe Felisco, he he gave a wonderful workshop at Crossingen, as I believe he does every year. Yeah. And I and he begins by teaching breathing and the train imitation. And I asked him, how long did it take you to master it? And he, you know what he said? 35 years. So this is one of his many wonderful qualities that the humility yep. to, to say that this is something I still work at as, as the great artists do. So, but just out of curiosity, I mean, were you after a year of trying the two draw whole step bend, did it sound good or three months? Uh, it took me several months just to be able to play a single note with a tongue block, you know? Well, the tongue block is hard. I, I, you, uh, I, you block tongue block and pucker. So they, they call that a hybrid. Um, so, cause we don't just only play blues, Julio and I, we do Celtic and I took Conway class and it helped me learn a lot about oh he's so great oh he's so he, great he's so fun he's just they're another I, humble they're guy all, the ones that are good they're are very humble and like i think humility is is part of ethics i think absolutely no it, it, i'm so glad to hear you say that because i devoted an entire chapter in my last my most recent book called the good ones 10 crucial qualities of high character employees. And one of those crucial qualities is humility. The, it's the close cousin of gratitude. And yes, it, this is one, it absolutely is a part of ethics because ethics is not just about answering the question, what should I do, but also who should I be? And therefore that takes a smack dab to the world of virtues. But speaking of humility, Phil Duncan, one of the masters of the country tuned harmonica. I, I asked him a question about it and in the hallway of uh, the spa convention and he pulls me over and gives me a mini master class in the country tune harmonica with the guy who literally wrote the book he had just published a book from mel bay on it and i, I bought it, it from yeah. him he signed it but i mean where else again could you get that kind of instruction and uh just just tremendous so well back to I, the... just, I just you know what i do think everybody and i do mean everybody should Take up some kind of hobby that they are terrible at doing at the beginning, you, where no matter how accomplished you are in your field as, as a parent, as a teacher, whatever it is you do, to do something else where you're a complete novice and you have to start from scratch. That's why, you know, at the age that I am, it every day is an exciting challenge. I mean, it, as uh, that Lancelot Link, <laughs> Secret Chimp, that wonderful uh, show from the 70s, had a had a great uh, soundtrack album, and one of the songs called "Evolution Revolution" has a song has a line. Um, Won't you try a new way? Every day is a holiday when you start it off with a bang. Jason Ricci says he begins every day by saying, uh, "This is going to be another great day." That's how he starts his day. It's very inspiring. Yeah, yeah. Very, you know, I I don't think I met anybody real Debbie Downers at the spa convention. I can't. There aren't any Karens anybody. and Debbie Downers. There just aren't. And if you are, then you know, don't come back. You, you got to be happy. <laughs> well, I hope you'll. I hope you'll bring your um, your booth back because that was that was a lot of fun. And you were selling Charlie's uh, CDs, right? Well, and I'll tell you how that went along. You know, um, Phil Duncan and I. Um, I first met him in two thousand nine, but then as I became a vendor and we became, he just he loves me. I love him. He comes in, we smile, we hug, we talk. So he calls me up. Um, before the Tulsa that I met you at. And he's like, Hey, Nedra. And I'm like, Oh, surprised to hear from you. You know, and he says, well, I, I want to ask you a favor and see what you think. Would you mind um, if we give you a whole table and for your stuff? And then I want you to take care of Charlie, Charlie muscle white. Okay. <laughs> oh yeah. Now, who's going to turn that down? Right. I mean, but he approached it in a way to ask me if I would want to do it. And I was, of course I wanted to do it. I couldn't. Who's remember. going to turn that down? So wait, so you, so you were the only booth there selling Charlie CD. I was his, I was his. And so, but what I said was, would you mind if I put it out there, you guys and sell everyone's CDs, just have them bring them down to me. So I was there especially for Charlie and the Charlie was going to be in the booth talking and with, and we got to be friends and talk and hang out and, and then I was going to handle his stuff. That's why I have that one picture with him and he's got all the money and he's smiling because it was all cash, which became kind of um, difficult because I had envelopes. I'm doing my booth 
And then I had all the envelopes for everybody's and I was trying to keep everybody's money straight with their CDs and, um, you know, that kind of thing. So it became a little bookkeeping heavy for the brain. And I, I, I know, well, you know, interviewing so. some of the, the, one of the things I really enjoy doing being a singer, songwriter, producer here, because it's all out of my own, um, hands here is I loved the interviews when they're publishing a CD that they wrote and like, um, with Charlie Broth and and Jerry and and Michael Rubin, the process that got the the strain, the process, the years to get and write and produce your own CD and your music on no budget. It's not like um, uh, Warner Brothers is coming in and giving you a sixty thousand dollar check to do. You're you're doing this because you want to and you want to share that and that process. And that's been the podcast that I want people to see that. Maybe there's no money. There's no big pot of gold at the end unless you, you know, especially nowadays, other than you might break even, you might make a little bit, and you're you're getting to do what you love, and you're getting to play. Do you music. happen to know, Nedra, uh, the percentage of spa members who are professional musicians full-time? Do, are, are there, I, is I there don't have it. I don't know that? the stat on that, but it seems like they're – the thing to me, and stop and think about this, there are there's all these people there with the same love, but they're not famous, but they might be as good. They might play as well. I, uh, you know, they might be doggone good, but it's a very, very well. tough life being a professional musician. Yeah. That's why I, you know, yeah. David Barrett uses the word hobby to refer to someone like me, but I don't think of it as a hobby there. It's, I don't you. know if spiritual calling is too hoity toity a term, but it's it's uh, to me hobby is collecting coins, stamps, uh, windsurfing, but um, music it's just it's the most soulful thing you can do, and to be able to do it without any pressure that to me is the gift. If on top of everything else you had to, there were hungry mouths to feed, dependent upon your getting gigs. I would think that would be one of the most stressful things. And now with the record industry being what it is, people can no longer make money from CDs. It's strictly um, uh, uh, touring. I mean, Aerosmith has complained about how they, they no longer make money on their albums because they here talk about an ethical issue, intellectual property theft. People will just put, put the entire album on YouTube. And then you'll see in the comment section, thanks, bro. Thanks so much for making this available. Thanks. You're, you're stealing intellectual property from an artist who deserves to be paid for their labor. People don't even see this as an intel, as, as an ethical issue. And this is one of the things I teach all over the world, why intellectual property theft is something that should concern us all. People think, well, you hear this horrible expression, the internet wants to be free. No, it doesn't. It doesn't want anything. It's just a thing. It depends on how we use it, whether it's it's right or wrong. And uh, it, it just upsets me that people don't even appreciate how somebody's uh, blood, sweat, tears, uh, uh, sweat, equity, uh, soulfulness yeah. went into making this song, this album, this work of art, and you're just taking it from them? Yeah, with no thought. Well, you know, my first CD I did was called Moving On, and I it was just me, and I wrote the music, and it blah, 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 you know, it, I not thinking nothing. And I really didn't sell very many copies of it. I just kind of homemade them and sold them here and there, like maybe five, maybe 10 copies. And it got stolen and out there. But I had, I had learned from a Jerry Gallup, a friend that wrote for Starship on intellectual property and how that you should always copyright your work. It's not hard to do. So I've copywritten every single thing with the Library of Congress never dreaming anything. Well, Spotify had my CD moving on with all of it. I'd wondered, I'd ran into people that knew my songs and knew, I couldn't figure out why they had stolen it all. So we put together um, a, in the the joint class action lawsuit and I got several thousand dollars for what they stole. Can so, you talk a moment about um, what it felt like when you discovered that your songs had been taken without paying for it what did that feel like well you know i, I guess in it, there's a song by the um that blackberry um group out of the south where he says um i've always i've always figured out that uh there's a lot of hammers and i'm the nail <laughs> so it, it didn't surprise me i think that uh you felt like you were getting hammered you just or hammered no, I, on you i'm the like nail you know i'm just 
it's you, the luck is this the way it is. But um, I did follow through. But that's amazing. Life. But just, hang on, I I have to interrupt here because you, you say it joyfully. You say it with a laugh in your voice. You're smiling. I mean, I would be outraged. In fact, and get this, I'm not making this up. If you go to uh, the Amazon China page or the website for Amazon in China. I have a children's book that was translated into Chinese called, Is It Still Cheating If I Don't Get Caught? And there are pirated copies that Amazon China is making available. And people will write in the comments, not anything about the book itself, but that they bought a pirated copy. Now think about that. Someone yeah. is stealing a book on ethics. They don't see the irony in that. Yes. It's just... Yeah. So, but it bothers me that people are getting ripped off thinking they're buying something of quality when they're not. So in other words, if as you can tell by me talking about when I get ripped off, it bothers me when you talk about it and you kind of, well, you know, you just have well, a more I, joyful. I, for me, standing up for myself, I've, I've had to do and legally stand up for myself in different things. And I have been ripped off for a lot more than that. Um, and I won't, you know, I won't go into any of that because- that was big corporations and they take advantage and everybody is, is I, I believe in the end on things like that, that we're all paying for it. So it's so stupid that they think they're stealing something and getting away with it. When in the end, they're only stealing from themselves in the end, we're all paying for unions getting broke down and, and people not getting what they deserve. I, I think somewhere along the line, we all end up paying for it. Well, what's funny that is that's that the consolation, people stealing, but the people who are stealing from you and me and people listening to this, most of these folks would never go uh, when there were record stores, would go into a store and just pocket, a, you know, walk out with a Jefferson Airplane album or a, a Buddy Guy album. But but you go to uh, and listen to his music on YouTube for free that someone ripped a, and put up there. It's the same thing. It's it's just the same kind of theft. It just doesn't feel like that. Well, I think they're getting better at it because um, of algorithms, and they are getting better at it. Like CD, ba <clears throat> excuse me, CD Baby distributes our music, and there's algorithms. And any time anything, I have the stats on where they've gone, and I get whatever little amount of money because it takes a lot to add up to much. I do get it, and when I put up things, they YouTube now. They go through the algorithms and they distribute like they know, like I played Charlie Musselwhite and he's in there or Jason Ritchie and they're in there and they're going to get their little bit of money from that. And I've always bought the CDs and bought the music I played or they've been given to me by the artist. And I'm happy now that these algorithms do read and it may not be a lot of money, but it is something if you have it out there with someone distributing it. And well, I know so YouTube of, um, will stick commercials in there. Um, if, well, if you do try to put someone else's recordings up there, but you have to claim, you have to proactively claim rights to the money or, or YouTube gets it. And, yeah, and I've noticed on Facebook, even if you just want to post um, uh, a recording of you playing, let's say knocking on heaven's door, you're playing the harmonica to it and you just play it for your friends, not for the public. You uh, Facebook will not allow it to be uploaded because it detects uh, that this is somebody else's intellectual property, which is nice. Yeah, of course, if, if you were to just record that song that Bob Dylan wrote and play, put it up there yourself, it, I don't think it would would grab you for that, although that's also a form of intellectual property theft by you know yeah, not I paying Bob what he what he deserves for having written the song. Well, on one of our CDs, we did do a couple cover tunes, and I bought the rights to sell a hundred copies of those. So, and when, how much? Do you mind if I? I'm just curious, and I think this might be of interest to listeners. What, it what wasn't that bad. It was only like twenty five dollars for a hundred. And think about that twenty five dollars for a hundred copies. That's 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 you don't uh, get much chicken feed, and yet, and so, I th I just think this has to be presented more as um, as a concern for all of us. You know, I've when you buy that. a DVD or the days when you used to buy DVDs, there were warnings at the beginning of uh, the uh, yeah. presentation about not stealing it. And of course, it's harder to steal what's on a CD than it is uh, a DVD than it is on a CD. Yeah. And now yeah. There, there are even apps where you can just record whatever is playing on your computer. Well, yeah. 
we put a thing up on um, TikTok, and it it's um, it's an in, just it's just a little intro to a song, and it's, you know it's a real small clip, and everybody's using it um, to put their videos up to. Now, I'm not upset about that because I'm glad that they appreciate it and they find beauty, and they're making these awesome videos with that little clip, and um, so so it, I I don't get upset about stuff like that, and I always buy and pay for music because of these things that's that is because you're an artist and you know what it feels like to get ripped off and by the same token i think people who have been servers in restaurants they're the best tippers because they know what a difficult thankless job it is yeah um always catering to people who are always complaining and leaving often little or no money uh it's an absurd system where you know the customer has to pay the salary of the person serving rather than having the restaurant do it but right, were you ever ser- ever a server when you were growing up? Yes. And how do you, how, do you tip well? Yeah, we do. And our our kid, um, <laughs> some of our children are. So I mean, you know, we know the struggle and how it is. But I, you know, I I've always just had an attitude of enjoying what I'm doing. I even enjoyed those jobs. I this is one of your many <laughs> wonderful qualities that you just you convey the sense of joy and living, and it's just so nice to see, especially at a time where there's so much rage in the world and rage um, in the guests you interview for this podcast um well there I, should be we should be we should be outraged about a lot of the stuff that is yes. going on and I, you know to tell to to figure out how to change it that's a hard one because i mean we just went through the writer strike and the ai and the artificial intelligence and like you said that people are stealing and thinking that that's okay and that's out there, the internet, you're in the world and it's like the wild west now, you know, it's like there's gunslingers and there's people looking to steal your identity and your money and your name and everything. So it, it's critical to be very cautious. And, um, so it's, like I said, it's the wild west, but it's, you know, the- I need to write a sequel to this kid's book, which by the way, has been translated into Italian and, uh, it, the Italians did such a beautiful job printing it and, Um, making it a a readable work of art. But I I think we do need to teach very young people about this issue because uh, let's give people the benefit of the doubt. A lot of these folks are not uh, acting with evil in their heart. They're not they're not actively stealing. It doesn't even occur to them that it's an issue at all. And so to just teach people that, uh, you know what, just because it's on the Internet doesn't mean it's free. And you should pay people for their labor. Just these basic things. I, I just wonder if if this were part of elementary school education, if people would then grow up with an appreciation of uh, the value, the importance of paying for what you get. That's a, that's an awesome point. I work at a youth center and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I teach art and music there with to the young and have for 16 years. Um I'm an independent contractor there and and I volunteer a lot. We do an open mic and different things. And um, we do teach different things than the schools are teaching. You know, we do try to teach um, a little bit more um, compassion, understanding, forgiveness of yourself, because it's brutal out there. You know, it seems like a lot of the things out there are tough on kids and um, it's tough on the parents. And, you know, so. It, we're in a real rural area, so we have uh, we have people that um, have a rough time, I guess. And but we have a wonderful town. I'm living in a really rough time uh, because why? Economically, you know, um, it's hard harder to make money. It seems, and then it goes. It doesn't go far enough. And so, pa- two parents are working, and the kids are. You know, they go to school, they come to us, they go home, they do their homework, they get up again, and and stuff, and so it's hard to fit everything in. I know for parents, like it is, I was a single mom and I had to work several jobs. And so it, I was fortunate to have family around that helped, but you know, it, it, they come there to us and they get something different. And that's, I, I had just taught a class on self-actualization. It was an art class where I told that we talked about, um, through history, self-portraits and how that, and what I wanted to imply was that's different than a selfie than, um, <laughs> So I gave them a lesson plan and they each took it. And I was just amazed on just giving them that concept, how their mind. I would take that class. Yeah, it was a really good class. And, and Have you been to the National Portrait Gallery in D.C.? It's part of the Smithsonian, but it's not on the mall. 
No, but I would go. It's if nothing I was but there. portraits. Yeah, and I I guess those aren't technically selfies since someone else is painting them. But um, that that's a a wonderful point you made. Um, you know, we haven't. I guess now we're sort of on the periphery of what you and I are talking about is uh, the P word politics. And I will say that an, another great reason to go to spas for one week, no one's talking about politics. There was only now there was one. I don't know if you saw this fella. Uh, there was an older fella there, which, of course, is about 95 percent of the people. <laughs> oh, but uh, yeah, he that, had a hat. He had a hat made out of Bud Light carton. Yes, and I do. I, believe he was making a political statement but if he if he was it was relatively subtle but didn't come you know it's just a great to get away for one week and to just be united through music and it didn't doesn't matter what people's political or religious backgrounds cultural backgrounds were there to to make music and connect with one another through music and it is fabulous enjoyed. and and i you know this was the interview i wanted i want the world to know what it's like to be a harmonicist in this time in life. And I, you know, I want to um, try to set up maybe in six months, we'll do another one and we can talk more about what you're learning and you can show us how the progress on that two whole two step. For everyone who's made it this far through the, through the episode, um, I if you write to me through my website, which is theethicsguy.com, theethicsguy.com, mentioned that you made it to the end of the episode and I will send you one of my harmonica themed ebooks that um, I put together as a, a thank you for not turning it off after I tried to play the low rider riff. Uh, you know what? I could tell what it was and that it is. Oh, well, that's good. I'm glad you know, that, you know my, it also helped that I set it up and said that it, that's what it did, was. You but, did yeah. help. We did. We, um, I always think of the Seinfeld um, episode where, where she says war, what are we fighting for? And she says it to the guy that wrote the book. You know, I mean, I've I've done that. I've sat next to somebody, and it's the guy that, like you said, it's the guy that literally wrote the book. And um, you're say, making a statement to him. So but no, you know, I, at Spa, if you did that, if you were talking, you know, to <laughs> Howard Levy and not knowing who he was, he wouldn't uh, pull rank on you and and condescend. It, 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 uh, Charlie Musselwhite well, wouldn't either if you didn't know who he was. Right. It's just. I, I really do think uh, you hear this a lot at the spa meetings that there's something special about the harmonica community. And I, from having spent many decades in the speakers community, I hear it there. And I spoke to the peanut and tree nut association of America once, and they will say, you know, there's something special about being a peanut and tree nut farmer. <laughs> there, doubtless there are the special aspects of all these things, but there really is something unique about this community. And maybe it's because we don't have the respect uh, that we deserve and other people uh, maybe look down on us as, as uh, musicians, but um, maybe that contributes to the, the humility. You have to be humble to keep, to keep going with this instrument, right? Because um, yeah, you every don't, day don't, someone's yeah. like, oh, yeah, that's cute. A harmonica. Yeah. My three, my, my six month year old uh, infant can play the harmonica. Yeah, I once was I was in a, a really fancy place and I had it I had my wares there and I was all dressed up and I'm like, I'm man, I'm I'm having this. And this lady walked by and go, Oh, harmonica, what are we gonna buy this and play it around the campfire? And she walked away. <laughs> it's like, ah, oh, hi. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It in and, and you you know, you have to have thick skin to do anything and to keep doing to keep going with it. You know what I would music. if I had a harmonica, I wouldn't mind getting contaminated. I would give it to that person and say, Okay, play one note. Just they can't play one note. Can't do it. Yeah. Can't do it. Yeah. No, I, there's now, that wouldn't that be uh, maybe we should all carry around cheap harmonicas that we can give to people. I get and say, I get okay, it's it's that. easy, huh? Try try play a note. Ben, I get to do that. Try to spot. play now. Bend that note uh, down a whole step on the two draw. See if you can do that. Oh, I've it's harmonica it's hard, player. isn't it? It's pretty hard. I've had harmonica players want to duel me in a parking lot before. Come on, I know I can outplay you. Come on, we'll have a duel. Really, you hear that? I've oh. had it happen once, and I I thought it was the strangest thing. And then the fact that I'm female, because most of them are male, and and there's a female up there, which is really a novice novice novelty to some, but yet to others, it's you know. Uh. But um, no, and so Horner, I I just get um, the toy harmonicas like 
but they, you know, the toy ones, the, the multicolored globes. And, um, I do, I do a lot of events where I give them away. In fact, Wednesday, when I talk, I'm going to give them all, it's a rotary club and I'm going to give them all a harmonica with some notes and, and have them have Julio do some blues and have them call and response back. So, you know, you give it, you get out there and you educate and you share and it grows regardless you know it's feel it's, people it's, take you less seriously as a harmonica player because you're a woman um no i don't think they take i think they take it serious i think that uh with men sometimes i have noticed it's challenging at first they'll be challenged but then when they get to know me they i'm sorry they end up loving me so oh. they, then it's all good you know and then they then they'll respect nice. you and want to play with you and they'll play nice one thing i learned right away was harmonicas can play together you it's like what david's having you do in that circle first time i went in that circle i was sitting next to andy just and will chalet and i didn't know and i did my riff and people liked it and um so the call and response and going and sharing can be done with i do have one more question because i want to add a little snippets of music here and there so who do you listen to who is your first harmonica player that you recall you like what they did and it inspired you? Mine was Norton Buffalo. Everybody kind of already knows that, but who was yours? Well, when I began my uh, lessons with David Barrett, he asked me, what are your short-term goals and what are your long-term goals? And the short-term goal was to be able to play uh, Think of Me by Neil Young, the first track on his Colorado album, because he's playing harmonica and guitar at the same time and singing. And um, you know what? It sounds so easy. And yet for anyone who's tried to play harmonica and guitar at the same time, it, it, it is not easy. So that was my short-term goal, Bob Dylan, Mick Jagger. But then, you know, once I, I learned from the harmonica community about a fellow named Sonny Terry, and I heard that, I was like, wow, this is so good. And um, there are just so many, but I, I love, Hearing David Barrett play, Joe Felisco play. I, I liked hearing you and Julio at, at the spa yeah. convention last year. I mean, Jason Ricci, ah, oh, what a what an inspiration. I can't think of anyone uh, out there where you say, like, Ugh, I'm never gonna listen to that again. No, no, and no, no, no. Um, for me it was hard to go because I was in um I was in Goose, it was in North Highlands of Charleston, South Carolina, and I was a teenager, and I'd sit in my beanbag chair and listen to Heart of Gold and get that <laughs> down. So I did a video of tribute to him, and we we play Heart of Gold sometimes um, in shows, and people always, always like it, you know? So can and, you play the harmonica and the guitar and sing that at the same time? Oh, there's no way. No, no. I I, I tried learning guitar, and um, then I met Julio, and he tried learning harmonica, and then he met Nedra. So that's how we put it together. It, and that's oh. why I, I, there was no way. And um, either way, he his harmonica playing was as bad as my guitar playing, but not horrible. And so that's how I ended up doing that. And I've tried other instruments, and I went, why don't I just study the one? It's enough. And so that's when I stopped. I was I did drums and hand drums and congas. And I've been in bands where I was a percussionist. Um, so the music's in there. And then I just decided to just stick with the harmonica. By you the know? way, I don't know if you, if you want to include a, a clip of some original music here, but I just wrote and recorded my first original song called Maisie's Blues, named after my cat Maisie. So I can send you an MP3 and I give you my permission to. Oh, put that's it out wonderful. There. I premiered here. No, that's awesome. Yeah, let's do that. Awesome. Thank you. 
let's do that. Okay. Thank you so much, Nedra. What a treat. Thank this you. Is. You keep going. I I love watching what you're doing with David because he is a he's a tremendous teacher. He's um he knows everything. I it, and a I, great human being. I mean, he has changed my life, and so many other students will say you just you changed my life for the better, and it's true. And well, I mine too. He was the first in '99. The master classes were different that he put on debt. They evolved into even deeper. I you know full days with people. I had full days with Joe Felisco and full days with Dennis Grueling and David Barrett, and went in there and met a lot of wonderful people and set me on the course to doing it correctly and, and stopping my bad habits. Uh, mm -hmm. But I'm sure I still have them. I still probably have a lot of bad habits. Who knows? But I mean, yeah. And so I, like I said, maybe in six months we'll do this again and you can send another a song and you can tell us all about where you're at in the journey. And I hope to see you at spa. If not the next one, maybe the one after that, because I've been going since 2009 when I can. <laughs> so absolutely yes to everything you just said all right sounds good we'll talk soon bye bye be well bye nedra bye what fun that is i tell you i enjoy talking to bruce he's quite a guy and love his enthusiasm for our instrument the harmonica and um, his journey so i'm going to close this out with the song that he said it was one of the first to inspire him as i said mine was heart of gold and his is think of me get out your harmonica and just enjoy the day blowing and a going so keep it real tune in and thank you for being here with us today bye bye for now when you see those geese in the sky think of me i can spread my wings and fly just like them Gallop across your open prairie while I dive below your deepest sea. Think of me. I'm gonna live long and I'm happy to report it back to you. It's a window. Slither in the ditches.